This video is sponsored by Brilliant. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre series saw a recent reboot in 2022 with the confusingly named Texas Chainsaw Massacre, an irritating naming convention that always ensures you have to ask for clarification on which one is being discussed every single time it comes up in conversation. Which Halloween? Doom or Doom but the 2016 one? The senior or junior George Bush? It's a risky naming convention too, like is it The Thing or is it the shit reboot of The Thing with all the CGI, although for the record I actually quite like the reboot, it's just I only ever hear it referred to as the latter. To name two films the same name is to set them at odds from one another right from the beginning, an ill omen that is only going to result in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and that weird Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot with all the weird political messaging. Texas Chainsaw Massacre's 2022 reboot was directed by David Garcia, no, not the footballer, the director, oddly enough. He said in an interview with Polygon that while the film had social commentary, he did not wish for the film to make a statement on political issues, describing the gun politics of the film specifically as very nuanced. These sentiments were roughly echoed by the film's producer Fede Alvarez, who stated in an interview with Collider that the film deals with topics of gun violence and morality, that it is intentionally vague and purposefully lacks clarity in its themes, and that the intention of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is to explore moral and political division. And having now seen the film twice, I feel extremely confident in being able to say that yes, the film does grapple with controversial topics, but it's certainly not nuanced. And what effort you could argue was made to explore moral and political division is bogged down by the limitations of the genre. To put it simply, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot doesn't work. And while you could certainly make an argument that it's down to the writing, you could also make a case to say that moral statements are never going to mix with slasher horror fiction due to the specifications of the genre itself, and I'm going to argue both of those today. But before I do, let me tell you about the best free and easy way to learn maths, data science, and computer science interactively. Brilliant features lessons ranging from anything like understanding everyday technology all the way through to AI and neural networks, and for the real big brains amongst you, computer science and programming. Seriously, I was made to do tons of Java at university and all I learned was pain. I'm a designer, goddammit. Still, I could have benefited from the Thinking in Code course which teaches you to design simple programs that solve real world issues. Luckily for me, Brilliant actually customises content to suit your requirements and allows you to solve it all at your own pace. Take a quick quiz when you sign up to be matched with content of a relevant skill level and topic, or with built-in step-by-step projects and solutions to get you coding on your own terms. So get started today with 30 days free. The first 200 viewers get 20% off an annual plan over at brilliant.org forward slash mertkk. That is brilliant.org forward slash mertkk for 30 days free off your Brilliant subscription. I've not seen the previous films in this series, in fact my only experience with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie series is Leatherface, as played as or against in Dead by Daylight. He's incidentally my least favourite killer on both sides of the coin, so needless to say I never felt much of an urge to explore Bubba's life in film after spending 15 minutes at a time hanging from the hooks in the Midwich basement. However, when searching for some Halloween flicks to enjoy with some of my friends, Netflix recommended this pretty enthusiastically, and I can say that this movie requires zero knowledge of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series up to this point, you can watch it as your first film in the series and have an experience that doesn't rely on prior exposition from one of the many previous films. The plotline is extremely simple, introducing all new characters to serve as our animals for slaughter, besides Leatherface of course who requires no introduction. The 2022 Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot is one of those pieces of media that claims to try and mock everyone equally, which isn't really a claim I get behind. I've always enjoyed South Park for example, I think it's got some really funny moments, and I like the way the writers approach their storytelling, but even that show doesn't really mock people equally, because people are never going to be on equal footing to begin with. Moreover, how do you quantify mockery? Did Eric Cartman get five mocks while Al Gore got eight mocks? How do you measure that? Are you being mocked proportionally? How do you define proportional? I know this is splitting hairs, so don't take this as the crux of what this video is going to be about. But personally, I would rather do away with the claim that a piece of media mocks everyone equally. Because in the context of both real life and the context of writing a narrative, I don't think that's logistically possible. 
In Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for example, we have a cast split down the middle by political division. One side is explicitly left-wing, featuring all of the insufferable stereotypes of environmentally conscious millennial kids and their phones, and the other side is an extremely even-handed, cherry-picked depiction of rural right-wingers living in the middle of nowhere on the Bible Belt. Yes, the left and right-wing can be mocked, especially the American Democrats and Republicans, which even to us Brits just resembles right-wing and incredibly right-wing respectively, but it's not really possible in an 83 minute film that requires plot build up, complications and resolution. Someone has to be the troublemaker, setting the events of the plot in motion, someone has to be the moral compass, someone has to be the victim, and these roles are distributed disproportionately, resulting in a film whose messaging is resolutely right wing. And while that's not a bad thing on paper, Texas Chainsaw Massacre fails to deliver its message effectively, so let's explore it. The 2022 Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot, with that weird cancel culture phone scene, centres around an extremely small, isolated town in Texas named Harlow. Harlow is a town on its last legs. Most of the buildings are empty and dilapidated, with only a few actual residents still physically present. They are cut off from any major city by a gruelling seven hour drive. The only locals we meet are Richter the Handyman, a couple of police officers, an older woman credited on the IMDb page only as Mrs M, who runs the local orphanage and our only orphanage dweller, a retired, dormant Leatherface, now sitting squarely in his 60s. And don't let that fool you either, he is still incredibly supernaturally strong. The central plot of this film, beyond the gratuitous murder, is the invasion of Harlow and the disruption of the status quo by a bunch of heaving liberal scumbags who descend on the town and its inhabitants like locusts. They buy all of the derelict unowned property and auction it off to the heaving liberal scumbag friends so that they might start businesses and families surrounded by like-minded individuals in a town that they don't need to sell a kidney to be able to afford the down payment on a house in. This backfires. Lying previously inactive on the cold dead floorboards of a dusty little orphanage, to cut an extremely long story short, Leatherface wakes up and chooses violence. Triggered by the accidental death of his adoptive mother, the aforementioned orphanage owner, Leatherface embarks on an insane chainsaw wielding rampage across the runtime of this film, writing the status quo in the process. Like karmic retribution for bringing their strange little TikToks to this dead town in the middle of fucking nowhere, Leatherface goes utterly ballistic until he is the only person left. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot is explicitly a cautionary tale against gentrification. Defined as the process whereby the character of a poor urban area is changed by wealthier people moving in, improving housing, attracting new businesses, and displacing current inhabitants in the process, gentrification doesn't feel like it applies to the tiny town of Harlow. First of all, there are no current inhabitants to displace, none that we see anyway. This is the rotting corpse of a town that died decades ago and is now being purchased piecemeal to auction off and rejuvenate. Secondly, if the influx of citizens were to establish their own economy, so what? Harlow is demonstrated to us as a town separated from other urban centres by at least a seven hour drive. It doesn't even have a local hospital, an issue that contributes massively to the orphanage owner's death, a fact that is instead brushed over for the sake of pointing fingers at teenagers with their phones. I mean, that is simplifying things, but we'll get to that part later. Harlow is an extremely remote town, and these individuals are moving here to open coffee shops and art galleries. This isn't an impoverished, underfunded neighbourhood sitting quietly outside New York City, waiting to be swallowed whole by the beast that is the Big Apple, forcing dwellers further and further away from their local amenities. This is a remote, abandoned town that will see the growth of a small, self-sustained local economy. If we strip away the antics of this herd of clans, clowns and just look at their actions and motivations, it's not really a negative that they're here. Maybe that's the point, and so a few early lines shared between characters suddenly put the idea of a cult on the table, like moving out to Texas somehow wasn't evil enough. So you guys are what, like a cult? We're the idealistic individuals who want to build a better world. Yeah, that's a cult. 
These cult implications are abandoned as quickly as they are raised, more there to eliminate any possibility that this is a group of good people and that their presence might be a positive. Rather, it frames them as an insidious mob with weird self-worshipping implications, perhaps even a tickle of the occult. And third, the officious townsfolk seem, at points, absolutely fine with leaving the pervasive rot of Harlow, and the new arrivals are perfectly fine with adopting it as it is, maintaining the buildings exactly as they are. They comment, leave it as it is, we like the history. This line almost feels like a mistake on the director's part, since it nullifies this perspective of the locust city folk arriving on scene to destroy and replace the local tradition. They don't mind the local tradition, regardless of what it represents, and they even want to preserve it. Despite their enthusiasm, Richter regards these newcomers like vermin. The only way to deal with an invasive species is to eradicate them. On site. This scene takes place in the prologue, wherein our gang encounter Richter and his gas guzzler filling up on petrol. They mock his coal roller and suggest what his carrying a massive gun everywhere might say about the size of his penis, and his first instinct is to imply that he is going to shoot them. A curious icebreaker for sure. Threatening to shoot your new neighbours is how you assert dominance, and fair enough, it does work, especially for Richter, who drops threats of gun violence with the same lackadaisy attitude that I I might tell somebody about a parking situation with. As he coolly speeds past them, heavy metal music blaring, you get a sense that these starry-eyed teenagers have met their match. The trope of city folk failing to understand the dire extents of their new unfamiliar environments after leaving the safety of their homes is extremely common in horror, especially in this kind of inbreds in the desert media like the Texas Chainsaw series and The Hills Have Eyes. They are fish out of water, operating in a geography that exhibits none of the rules they're accustomed to. Your law doesn't apply here, say the cannibals and the cultists, and you have to play by our rules if you want to escape. Texas Chainsaw Massacre's setup is similar to an extent. Rather than learning the laws of the land and beating the brutish cannibal family at their own game, the arc of Texas Chainsaw Massacre culminates in the main cast growing to accept the functional benefits of firearms. Richter straddles a weird set of functions, being that he clearly serves two roles often met by different characters in similar films. At the beginning of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot, he is the unwelcoming, morally ambiguous local who warns the main cast to leave out of a knee-jerk sense of sneering cruelty. Still, the writers really like him and they think he's really cool, so he also remains present to behave as the I told you so guy, and later as the moral compass, creating a strange dissonance between local petty hostility and completely morally balanced even-handed judgement. He will be an entirely different character between scenes. Also, he is played by Mo Dunford, who is extremely hot. It makes for a very confusing combination. As the movie wears on, Richter finds himself facing off against the scourge of leftist stereotypes, coffee and art galleries, something he approaches with obscene eye-rolling distaste. Generally, our left-wing cast members are depicted as a cancer that latches onto the town of Harlow for the worst a loss for both sides, an impossible introduction. And this brings us back to the we mock both sides claim. While, again, you can reasonably mock both sides of the coin, the structure of this film situates Richter as a reasonably standoffish victim of cultural colonisation. A man who has done nothing but live peacefully here and will now be punished unfairly as a swarm of blood-sucking liberal freaks arrive on site to take away his tradition. And as the lexicon of the film starts to brim with unsubstantial Twitter buzzwords, Leatherface gets involved. We see this explicitly demonstrated to us shortly after Leatherface returns from witnessing the unfair death of his mother. He falls into a chair in her room and awkwardly fumbles about with her clothes and makeup. We hear Catherine on the PA go, this town is ours, a definitive and caricaturish statement of evil intent, and this is what triggers Leatherface to stand up and start his killing spree, cause and effect. Everything Leatherface does is an answer to leftist entitlement, like a living vessel of bloody retribution. They want to swarm this town? Well, naturally, then he wants to kill them, and they'll be written poorly enough that you feel absolutely nothing when they die.
On the left-wing side of our cast, we see a concerted attempt to inject people of colour into positions of power, elevating them above the surprisingly egalitarian locals. Dante is our cult leader, a chef from the big city who has purchased all of this crumbling property to start his own pop-up settlement full of other individuals who want to open coffee shops and live in the sun, god forbid, and our bank representative Catherine, the symbol of Big Money's newly attained ownership over the small town of Harlow. They are both black. We are presented with a situation in which two black individuals arrive in the town weeks after purchasing every available building, leaving the poor struggling locals with zero recourse against this sudden capture of their properties and local history. These two individuals are in power over the white locals, colonizers infesting their land, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre chooses an especially notable way to demonstrate how their power is going to be used unfairly, the Confederate flag. So Leatherface and his mum live in the orphanage alone in the centre of town, quiet and unbothered. Leatherface is very old now, maybe he'll die soon. How kind and self-sacrificing is this orphanage owner to have given up her life to keep Leatherface locked away and docile, somewhere remote and isolated? If only she had a few more years, maybe his evil could have been sealed away forever. Not so. Having received confirmation that he purchased every property in the town, Dante honestly does not expect anyone else to be here. As he tours the town, taking stock of what he's bought, Dante notices the confederate flag hanging from the facade of the orphanage, and this is the trigger that leads him into the house and unwittingly into the course of events that will end in his gruesome death. He encounters Mrs M, who explains that there was a mix-up with the bank, but she's all paid up now and the property still belongs to her. They argue, Dante and Mel insisting that they own the property, and Mrs M insists that she definitely could show them that she has the deed to the property, but she just doesn't want to right now, she doesn't feel like it, and then she tells Dante to leave. He calls the police, who show up shortly thereafter, asking, this again, Mrs M? Employing a pattern of behaviour, and they try to remove her from the property by force, only the stress causes her to have a heart attack. Now, this is where the flag comes into play, and there are multiple reasons as to why it was such an intriguing decision for the writers to include. The first reason is obvious. Dante is a black man living in America, and no doubt he is well acquainted with racism. Especially when purchasing property in the rural extremities of Texas, he is not venturing into especially welcome turf. And arriving on scene, he sees a confederate flag hanging on a property that he believes he owns. It is absolutely within his right to feel uncomfortable at the sight of a confederate flag, considering what it stands for specifically in respect to him. It is well within his rights to want to have that flag removed from his property and to have expected Richter to have removed the flag prior to his arrival in Harlow. And yet Dante only cares about removing the flag because he is conscious that it will upset investors. How interesting. How specifically written. Here, we have a bus full of potential investors on the way here. If they see this flag, they're not gonna buy. Trust me. I'm getting the cowboy. This plot point features a dollop of willful absurdity on the director's part. Nowadays, most people understandably associate the Confederate flag with racism, so the fact that the filmmakers choose to offset the racism of the flag with the more predominant concern of, oh no, what are the investors gonna think, is telling, because it clumsily evades the very moral and social explorations that Garcia claimed he would be exploring in the first place. You would imagine that the response of a person of colour to a confederate flag would be an immediate one of, I don't feel very welcome here. But the directors intentionally skew that line of thinking by putting profit first in Dante's mind, linking back to the gentrification theme and taking the spotlight thoroughly off the racist implications. Also of note here is what the flag represents. To Dante, ludicrously, it represents a profit margin. He's cold, corporate, calculated. To Mrs M, it represents her rich local history and one of her last remaining connections to her grandfather. When challenged on the presence of the flag hanging from her building, she's like, Oh, that old thing out there? That there belonged to my grandpappy. It's all I have to remember him by. Please don't make me take it down. I love black people. Paraphrased, obviously. She runs an intersectional orphanage, the professional caretaker equivalent of having black friends, and this apparently absolves her from the reality of the situation. I've taken care of many boys like you over the years. I don't have a problem with <laughs> these books.
So on one hand we have Dante representing the slick boot heel of big banking, here to file a local culture down and make it marketable, and on the other hand we have a lonely sad old woman whose apparent only connection to her grandfather is through the We Lost the Slavery War flag hanging off the front of her building. At this point in the scene Dante takes a step back from the situation and asks Richter to remove the flag, which Richter rolls his eyes about but does so anyway. After the scuffle kills her and she is carted off by the police, Richter brings the flag to Dante and shoves it into his chest, staring Dante in the eyes as the flag drops to the floor. This demonstrates to us a judgement made by the film. Due to Dante's snowflake sensitivity, asking for a flag to be taken down from the facade of a building it turns out he doesn't own, he has placed his silly boyish feelings over the life of a poor sweet woman. Richter and the film both identify and highlight to us that Dante is wrapped up so much in his selfish snowflake entitlement that he will let people die for the sake of his political correctness. Richter's behaviour asks Dante, was this worth it, trading a woman's life for a flag? And the silence of Dante's response is a resounding, shameful no. At this moment the orphanage owner becomes a martyr. She dies as the flag is removed, directly linking her death to the ruination of her local culture. Dante has ripped her tradition away from her, and now her home, and now her life. This is clearly done for the end goal of making Dante and his cohorts seem like bratty entitled children who are so focused on removing symbols of racism that they prioritise that over anything else of importance. It would have been very easy for Dante to respond to her saying, I have no problem with Negroes, with something like, well that's great, but the people who flew that flag did, but instead he just storms out, which, while understandable, forces the movie to completely sidestep the issue of why he might be upset with such a flag in the first place. It paints Leatherface's caretaker in a saintly light, particularly since she is the sole link keeping Leatherface from going on a rampage. She is his one on tether to the world. The movie makes it clearly villainous for Dante to try to remove the flag, and when she dies as a result of their officious behaviour, he is similarly flippant, saying heart disease killed her, not us. In this sense, Leatherface's rampage is framed as karma. We see this too in scenes like the introduction, where our group is pulled over by white rural Texan police. Dante behaves carelessly and casually, and the police end up being stern but sweet. There are a lot of moments here where attention is drawn specifically towards the power imbalance of our cast, but this is only used to demonstrate entitlement. Now, would it really be a political film if we didn't try and tackle the school shooting epidemic? Yes, referring all the way back to this video's introduction, we see the explicit limitations of the slasher genre when it tries to pose the question, is it okay or justified to use guns in circumstances of self-defence? While you can't get much more justified in your self-defence than when facing off against actual Leatherface, a character many of us would feel 100% okay with being shot on sight, it would also be a bit of a piss-poor slasher affair if the gun actually worked on him. Even if we need to spend a significant portion of the runtime reassuring our characters that guns are like totally sick and cool. See, our main group are vocally opposed to guns from the moment they arrive on scene. They scroll absurdly generic anti-gun posts on social media, and Richter's comment about shooting feral hogs came about as a result of Mel making a disparaging comment about his overcompensation. They sneer at Richter for carrying guns around, but over the course of the movie they come to use guns themselves to varying success. The question of whether or not guns are necessary is framed to us basically before we even know the names of our main cast members. It is a topic of paramount importance to the themes of this film, and something that the writers clearly want to use and consistently push as a through line for the character arc of our final girl. Only this is barely scratching the surface of the problem with our final girl. See, our final girl and ostensible protagonist, Leela, is the sole survivor of a violent school shooting. She has developed very aggressive PTSD after this horrific occurrence, causing her frequent flashbacks and visible moments of stress, but the movie refuses to grapple with whether or not that is a just state of affairs. When we begin the movie, we see Leela scrolling through Instagram, showcasing various unbelievable anti-gun posts 
posts. What's interesting about this movie is that the anti-gun posts are generic. They are icons showing AK-47s crossed out with an X, when in reality anti-gun posts cite statistics. They tell you how many children have died in the United States from guns alone, they post a horrifyingly long list of every school where there has been a mass shooting in the past few years. Not this Microsoft Paint graphic design stuff. No guns? Wow, groundbreaking. Alongside the sheer falseness of David Garcia's assurance that this film doesn't deliver a statement on social issues, it's also clear that left-wing causes are not given the same charitability or coverage as conservative ones. We see this exemplified mostly in the flag discussion, where displaying one in front of your house merely means that you love your grandparents and aren't racist, a very specific perspective that encourages empathy and making exceptions, but also in the gun conversation where, on the other side of the coin, left-wing views are demonstrably vapid and underdeveloped, stupid, half-hearted and parroted. You're not against guns because you're actually morally against them, you're against guns because it's trendy, you're trying to fit in, but you don't really understand it. Leela, fed up with her friend's goals and careers, seeks out Richter in his workshop, clearly lulled by the same womanly compulsions I challenge any of you to resist yourselves. Leela sees his workshop and gun collection and mentions that she has been shot at. When Leela holds the gun, she gets a flashback to a school shooting. Richter's muted response is, that must be difficult to deal with, with no further commentary. Yeah, it probably was, Richter. Now, Texas Chainsaw Massacre treats firearms as a natural part of daily life, with a clear bias in favour of a conservative view on guns, where guns are not to blame for shootings, but rather firmly belong in society as a means of protecting oneself. Still, the reason Texas Chainsaw Massacre stumbled out of the gate with this one is because it's a slasher movie, which means that guns can't have too much of an effect or we would have no plot. They are rendered a completely ineffective tool to stop murders. The only thing that seems to hurt Leatherface is a shotgun. He has no reaction to any other damage he takes, but at the same time the guns do absolutely nothing but slow him down for a little bit. He takes a shot to the shoulder, which forces him to retreat, followed by multiple to the chest, the latter delivered by Leela herself once she sees that she has no other option to stop Leatherface with. Her grabbing the shotgun and hunting him down is shown triumphantly. She prowls through the dimly lit building with an expression of intensity. When she finally finds him, they duke it out for a bit before she gets a good aim on him and unloads the gun into his chest. Leatherface stands hesitantly, but is clearly not stopped until Melody appears, delivering a chainsaw uppercut that sends him flying into a stagnant pool of water. Leatherface seems defeated, only for him to come back in the final scene, where he pulls Melody out of the departing car and beheads her with a chainsaw. In a purely textual sense, this renders Leela's arc completely ineffective. The reason for this terse commentary is that Leela's arc is not about coming to terms with gun violence and how it has robbed her of a sense of peace, but rather becoming comfortable with guns. It's juvenile, like she fell out with them because of her trauma, but now she's putting her differences aside and becoming whole again. It's absurd. Leela became comfortable with guns and used them to defend herself and the town's remaining residents, but accomplished nothing. She ended up surviving herself, but she was the only one that did, again. And even then, what ostensibly stopped Leatherface was the chainsaw uppercut. He had taken multiple gunshots and was still moving. Clearly guns weren't the answer here either. Which makes it fail even worse on a thematic level, where guns are treated simultaneously as the answer and utterly ineffective. The movie wants us to say that Leela needs to become comfortable with guns so that she can stand up for herself in a world full of people like Leatherface. But for the slasher angle to work, Leatherface cannot be too susceptible to guns. So what we get is a half measure where the movie attempts to do both and neither works. And the result leaves a very nasty taste in your mouth, like a school shooting survivor has been used in an NRA advert. Fantastically, the movie digs in its heels hard at the idea of having a woman aligned with the left wing as its final girl. While Leela joins the cast as part of the left wing crowd, she is firmly at odds with them. She hates all of them. She has more chemistry with Richter than any of her other companions combined. She isn't obnoxious or entitled, and she doesn't care about their stupid gentrification project. It's her turn on the Xbox, and she is here to be politically neutral. This results in Leela, our final girl and only survivor, being suspended from judgement. 
moment. She straddles the centre line as a result of her extremely careful writing. She's not rude enough to be an issue for the right wing folk already living here, and not right wing enough to be at odds with her fellow main cast. She just kind of coasts down the centre, but bottom line, she doesn't disrupt the status quo. Just like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, she says, does, and is absolutely nothing. Her character entirely devoid of sustenance, just a cardboard cutout of a young woman with David Garcia hiding behind it going, wow, I have realised that guns are truly an asset to my daily life. This casts her behaviour as that of someone deserving of survival, and her survival is a reward of a character growth that she has made following her surviving a school shooting, like this was somehow the genesis of her strength. Why does my head hurt so much? The issue with this kind of political messaging beyond the obvious is that it is simply at odds with the slasher horror genre, both in ways that are completely illogical, such as our main character overcoming her fear of guns to shoot a slasher villain that is, by design, almost immune to bullets, but also in ways that are incredibly insensitive, i.e. using the extremity of a slasher villain to force a school shooting survivor to overcome her very real tragedy. Ultimately, our school shooting survivor coming to terms with guns and finding that they can be useful to her falls flat when everyone else who uses a gun dies. When bullets don't harm Leatherface, they can't really be used to argue that a good girl with a gun can stop a bad guy with a chainsaw. The somewhat triumphant nature of Leela getting the gun, for instance, is portrayed as the completion of her arc. She has gotten comfortable enough with guns to use one. All the claims of this movie is neutral fall apart when you think for even a second about the fact that this is obviously a work of fiction. The writers and directors had choices on how to frame things and what specifically to write and this is what they chose to do. In this sense, the author's claims flatly do not align with the resultant product. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is no exception to media that claims to do one thing and then just does another. They could have written Leela's arc to be that in order to defeat Leatherface, she needed to find her worth as a survivor. And understand that her survivor's guilt is undeserved. Instead of the climax be her taking a gun and ineffectually shooting Leatherface, it could have been something that frees her from the guilt of being a sole survivor, a thing a lot of people struggle with. Likewise, they could have given Dante a valid argument against the Confederate flag, such as any of the things already mentioned, but this is conspicuously absent too. They also could have had the lefties be on the right side legally and actually own the deed to the orphanage, but they don't, and it turns out that they inadvertently killed the caretaker for no reason. Really, if ever, are the city folk on the right side of the movie, morally. Instead, Texas Chainsaw Massacre treats the left-leaning crowd with contempt while showering a deep red town with sympathy. It is abundantly clear from the movie alone that the director's sympathies lie more with the rural town and the people within it. That's not surprising, given that he grew up in southern Texas, but it is ridiculous to claim that the film has no inherent lean or tilt toward one side or another. Leela is the only one who is given a sympathetic portrayal, and unsurprisingly, she is the one who doesn't want to be there, thinks that the whole venture is a waste of time, so on and so forth. Meanwhile, the films give conservatives a litany of justifications as to why their viewpoints on guns are right, why they might want to fly the flag, and why they dislike people from liberal cities. And then, when it starts to play with social media in one morbid scene featuring a bus full of liberals threatening to cancel Leatherface, it demonstrates a contempt for one half of the political political spectrum, a political demographic that is depicted as stupid, shallow, and vapid in this film, while the opposite demographic are cool, calm, respectful, and surprisingly tolerant. David Garcia might explain these conflicting themes away by saying, of course it's contradictory, the movie doesn't have a statement to it, but that excuse doesn't work because the film's framing obviously prefers one side to the other. In an interview with CBR, David claimed setting the film in Texas, beyond the literal name of the series, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, helped explore cultural clashes, and again reiterated that the film is not trying to say anything. Nothing whatsoever. Sure, David. This completely collapses when you take into account two things. Number one, the literal plot, and number two, the fact that David spent so long trying to say something that he forgot to characterise any of our central cast. In the emotional crescendo of the movie, Mel tearfully turns to her sister and admits, you never needed me, marking a moment in their relationship when Mel and Leela truly see eye to eye, a click of mutual respect. Only it doesn't land, because the movie has spent so long talking about politics that it forgot to make either of them likeable. Thank you for watching, and thank you so much to my patrons, most specifically Alice Teeters, Brian Bullock, Bile Hamaho Futh, Brendan Sidereal, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocher, Christopher Chavez, Fosh, Heidi, 
Lady, HM, Carissa Fulcher, and Sam Jones for being my highest tier patrons. I appreciate you all very much and thank you again to our sponsor Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to check out my URL in the link for 30 days free over at Brilliant. Again, the first 200 viewers get 20% off an annual plan at brilliant.org forward slash merkkk. That's brilliant.org forward slash merkkk for 30 days free off your Brilliant subscription. Thank you everybody and I'll see you in the next one.